Hi, Quick Take. Welcome to our discussion on the Hong Kong pro-democracy movement. With the new national security law imposed by China, what is next for the movement? To answer this and more, let me introduce you to our guest. We have with us Nathan Law, a former Hong Kong lawmaker and pro-democracy activist. And we have Tanya Chen, a Hong Kong lawmaker and founding member of the pro-democracy Civic Party. And I'm Karumi Mori for Bloomberg Quick Take. Thank you both so much for joining me today. Thank, Thank you. So the Hong Kong national security law has only been in effect since July 1st, but we're already seeing its impact. So let's take a look at our package. So what is the latest? The police have new powers. We've seen the first arrest. China has just set up its security bureau in Hong Kong. Tana, you're a lawmaker. What changes are you seeing on the ground? Um, first of all, as you, uh, as you have said, uh, we got our first arrest and, that, uh, um, and one particular defendant uh, actually went to court and uh, the um, appointed judge uh, was uh, uh, seated and uh, did not um, allow bail. Um, um, so you can see, uh, in fact, there is an implementation of such law. And secondly, uh, uh, with such power, the police officers, in fact, went to um, restaurants uh, or even um, some uh, district councillor's office to do investigations. And, uh, and, and so you can see that, in fact, they are exercising their powers without, um, uh, without telling or clearly telling uh, the content or the effect uh, of this law by our government. So you can see that actually they're using this as a kind of weapon to control um, uh, the Hong Kong people or the protesters. Right. And Nathan, as an activist, how has it been for you since the law has been put into place? Well, it's it tough to see that um, authority now has the sweeping power to well, basically do whatever, do whatever they want, uh, prosecute whoever they want, as long as they have the political willingness. We see some of the defendants on the first arrests that they are only in possession of stickers or, or flags that have, have the slogan song, and they are already being uh, arrested. So it's a clear demonstration of um, how the law will breach our freedom of speech. And for now, I think every political activist in Hong Kong are exposed to dangers of being arrested or even face like sentencing for more than 10 years of imprisonment. So for now, it's definitely like some may say that it's definitely the end of one country, two system. And I think this is a, a, a fair judgment. And can you talk a little bit about you disbanding and having to leave Hong Kong? So to answer everybody's question, why did you leave Hong Kong? Yeah, leaving is, has always been a really tough choice. Uh, I have to leave behind all my connections, my families, or even the two cats that I adopted on the street. But uh, for me, it's more than a personal choice because under the national security law, uh, the international front of the movement is largely limited on the ground. So people in Hong Kong, if they uh, continue to do what they have been doing for, year, for, for the past years on the international front, they will possibly be prosecuted under the law. So for me, um, leaving means that I could, as a public figure, I could uh, work on the international advocacy work on an international level, which is actually beneficial for the movement. So I think for me, it's more than personal choice. It's more than a strategic move uh, for the movement and shows my commitment towards that. 
A strategic move. Yeah. Okay. So, well, Hong Kong uh, Chief Executive Carrie Lam has said the law has had positive effects. So let's listen in. I forewarn uh, uh, those radicals uh, not to attempt to violate uh, this law or crossing the red line because the consequences of breaching this law are very serious. Uh, I'm pleased to say that uh, in the last few days, uh, I noticed, uh, you may dispute that, but I noticed that there has been an increasing appreciation of the positive effect of this national security legislation, particularly in restoring stability uh, in Hong Kong, as reflected by some of the market sentiments uh, in recent days. Surely, this is not doom and gloom for Hong Kong. That was Carrie Lam there speaking about the positive effects. Uh, Tanya, how would you respond to people who are supportive of the law? Well, of course, for those who support this, especially the Chinese government or even the SAR government uh, or the uh, or the new uh, office, the offices that, that will work for the new office uh, sent from China, you can, of course, see that they have a significant increase of power or even unlimited uh, power um, that uh, can control or uh, well, I would say well, or um, control different aspects of uh, people's life in Hong Kong. And um, this is such a wide, this law is with a very wide power. And at the same time, it covers like not only Hong Kong people, but also uh, almost everyone uh, on this planet. So it is, of course, a very effective way uh, for our government to um, oversee each and every aspect of our life. But for Hong Kong people, for ordinary Hong Kong people, uh, the government told us that it uh, it will only affect a small number of people, but in fact, that's not the the, the reality. Um, I guess um, uh, uh, you know about the book. My book is being pulled down uh, in the public library. So it's just a book that I published six years ago, and and now the public cannot access this book because this book is now under review due to the new law. So, what is the extent? Of this uh, effect, of the effect of this law, are, are they going to affect the libraries of in schools? Are they going to affect the publisher, the bookstores? All these things will not only affect um, our freedom of um, uh, movement or freedom of assembly. It will also affect our freedom of speech, our freedom of expression. All these things will be severely affected, and um, this this is the core value of Hong Kong. Yeah, um, Nathan, um, what do you think? How would you respond? I want to ask you the same thing. How would you respond to people who are supportive of the law? Well, uh, it's definitely an autocratic, uh, autocratic and authoritarian thought of supporting that. Uh, if you see uh, the legislation process of that, it circumvents all the local uh, consultation and legislation process. And even the government could not have access to the full content before it was published, before it was uh, enacted. So this is uh, definitely violating any forms of uh, procedural justice that we all treasure. And for the law, well, basically it is written in such a broad and vague term that none of us could really um, understand what uh, actions would violate the law. And that is how an autocratic government to create white terror and politics of fear to Hong Kong people. Carrie Lam in the clip said that, oh, if you don't cross the red line, you're fine. But where is the red line? What constitutes a violation of the law? It, it changes constantly, and no one could dispute that with the government. They say today, uh, the government could say that, oh, you say this slogan, then you violate it. And on the next day, if you are present uh, of uh, the um, candle vigil night on 4th of June, then you may also consider um, breaching the law. So, like, th these um, uncountable and um, well, difficult to grasp concepts. It's definitely a reflection of how authoritarian the government is. And people who uh, fully embrace their authoritarianism, of course, support them. But for Hong Kong people, most of us, we are cultured, uh, nurtured in such a liberal city and a liberal environment. We, of course, oppose that kind of draconian um, law and feel like it's definitely killing Hong Kong. 
You've both touched on control. So will there be censorship? The Hong Kong government has targeted pro-democracy books, putting some under review in libraries. Tanya, you touched on this earlier. Tell us which books are being placed under review and what does that say about the state of Hong Kong and just how much things have changed already in just a few days? Um, well, this is my book and the name is actually, it's quite um interesting because it says uh, journeys to food for food and democracy uh, this is a, a kind of um a, a interpretation but it's uh, about it it contains um uh, the articles that i've published back in um between 2012 to 2014 when i was not a uh, legislator mm -hmm. so it's just a very i would say uh, some of them are very ordinary uh, articles of course some some are my observation of the of uh, of the um, political situation at that moment and my comments on the sal government as well as the communist uh, parties but you can see that this is just a start. So as I've said, um, uh, we are talking about the public libraries now, but then are the school school libraries are going to review and took the same stand. And and then um, and then, for example, for my book, it may become a perpetual review. <laughs> so my books uh, may be pulled down forever. And and after being pulled down, uh, whether the publisher will uh, publish it again and then uh, how about the commentators? Are they going to, um, you know, self-censure themselves or whether the uh, newspaper are willing to publish these kind of articles? So I'm afraid that as uh, Nathan has mentioned, this these red lines, uh, it fluctuates a lot. They move everywhere and they just, and the government or even the office, just they draw line, um, uh, well, I, I won't say casually, but at least, you know, mm -hmm. according to their view uh, or according to their will. So um, it's just it very depends on uh, the, the attitude and it's very subjective without any um, objective standard or even uh, uh, criteria. So it's very, very difficult for ordinary Hong Kong people to grasp uh, where is the line. And, and those slogans, they can just issue. Uh, a statement and saying that this slogan uh, it's related to independence of Hong Kong, so it's bad, it should be banned. But but then how many slogans are there included? How many on the list? And at the same time, when you talk about the retrospective effect of this law, I think this is a very important principle of our common law system. Um, the government, as well as the chief uh, secretary for justice, uh, becomes very vague. Although there is a clause. Uh, saying that, you know, uh, we cannot, it's about this offense, it's about the timing of this offense. But then when they want to prove the intention, they may take evidence that is before the effective date of this law. So it becomes very dangerous for Hong Kong people or uh, those being charged or arrested, how they can prove themselves. And, and the standard is very, very different from uh, the common law system. So we've seen actions uh, by the government and we've seen reactions too by uh, different parties, including tech companies, big tech, like Facebook, Twitter, and Google. They've stopped giving data. Uh, TikTok pulled down its app from Hong Kong. So Nathan, as an activist, how will this change the way you operate and how you get your message across? Well, um, actually uh, not only TikTok, uh, like um, tech giants like Facebook and um uh, well, uh, Twitter, I, I understand that they, they have an internal de deliberation about whether it is still safe for them to operate in Hong Kong because there are clauses in the uh, national security law saying that, oh, if you have any, uh, in any position, may consider like assist them to, uh, well, uh, or review or, or, or reviews to uh, in, a, in compliance with the order of the government, you may be punished. And this is actually a huge, huge risk for um, a lot of media platform. So uh, yes, indeed, it creates chilling effects, not only for those people who believe in democracy or political activists. Well, for now, the tech giants, they're also worrying about their future. So this is such a draconian order. I don't, I don't, I don't know whether the government preempted such a pervasive uh, influence of that, and they are capable of handling this. Uh, the, 
the freedom of information, freedom of like uh, uh, world movement, etc., is crucial for Hong Kong. It's the cornerstone of our well well established uh, financial system. So if it fails um, the international community, what could be left in Hong Kong? And this is a question not only for like democratic development of Hong Kong, but the future of Hong Kong as a whole. So I think, yes, indeed, uh, it creates a much reversive effect than we used to think. And I think um, uh, this is, uh, well, definitely one of the worst timing of Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and Tanya, we just talked about a uh, big tech, but let's also talk about local businesses. What about the so-called yellow businesses uh, that may have shown their support for the movement in the past? How will they react and, and move forward? Uh, well, of course, they need some time to digest uh, the uh, the effect or the content of this law because uh, it's so um, wide and uh, but the, the content is so vague. Uh, and uh, and the police uh, went to uh, one restaurant to do investigation uh, just a few days after the promulgation of the new law. Um, and of course, they kind of uh, a bit vulnerable, but at the same time, uh, these restaurants are very creative. Uh, some of the owners um, uh, would uh, create a new land and wall uh, and will uh, do something um, very uh, creative uh, in order to show their support of the movement. And uh, of course, uh, all these things well made difficult. Uh, they may make uh, the movement a, a little bit uh, difficult, uh, but at the same time, I don't think they can change people's mind. And uh, for those um, economic circle, uh, I do believe that it, it will exist. It will, uh, it's uh, sustainable. Uh, but at the same time, they need to do it uh, in a very um, cautious way, because uh, based on the uh, offenses, the, uh, the section about offenses um, is so wide that it may also cover uh, economic activities. Um, so um, they, they, of course, need to take that into consideration. But mm -hmm. at the same time, they are still very strong, persistent, so I have full confidence uh, in them. Nathan, uh, Tanya just talked about having to proceed with caution. Do you have any advice for yellow businesses? What what should they be doing now? How how should they react and how should they operate or or, or show support if they want to show support? Um, well, I think uh, it's important that we don't um, preempt them or self censor ourselves too much because that is what they wanted to do. They want you to um, get what will be banned in the future. And then you will take the most conservative, conservative stance to take off all the uh, protesting substance that you have. I think uh, that is, uh, well, definitely the, 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 the effect that uh, the government wanted to create. But for us, we have to be persistent and tenacious and try to like um, expand that room of uh, resisting. So I think uh, that kind of like creative and subtle way of protesting uh, should be continued and I think uh, it is important for us to really have um, the bravery especially um, well all those uh, well uh, political figures mm -hmm. that we indeed have to stand firm to our core values and uh, to really express message that even though you have a sweeping power but uh, we the people will um, fight as long as we could and we will uh, try to um, well uh, contain or try to expand the room that uh, we, we, we have. Mm. Uh, I, I want to talk now about uh, international relations. A number of countries mm. have condemned China over the law, right? So Nathan, uh, you've drummed up support from international bodies in the past. Is that what you're going to keep doing? Yes, of course. I've been um, doing lots of interviews and uh, writing um, op-eds and uh, also connecting with uh, different political groups in different countries, and they are all well aware of the situation of Hong Kong. And for the past days, there have been uh, several countries uh, planning or offering safe boat plans for Hong Kong, like the UK, Australia, Taiwan, or even the US. I think this is definitely a signal that the international community recognized the crisis happening in Hong Kong, and they wanted to hold China accountable. I think this is a good signal. But in the long run, how we can form a more united or co coherent, coherent, coherent front and then um, work on multilateral 
or assertive ways that we could uh, really contain the authoritarian expansion of China? I think this is uh, one of the questions that the global community could consider and uh, should act together. And, and Tanya, I heard you respond a little bit when I when I started talking about international relations. What do you make of the international response to the law? I think that the movement last year in Hong Kong did awaken a lot of um, uh, 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 international communities. I mean, uh, you know, at least they focused uh, on uh, Hong Kong's matter. That's that's the first uh, first thing. And secondly, they understand that. Um, how a, a strong and upcoming China um, will um, influence the world. Uh, and uh, Hong Kong is like a showcase. So we need to evaluate or at least to ask ourselves uh, what is more important at a critical moment. For example, like um, uh, financial or um, econo uh, economy on one hand, and our core values, uh, democracy, human rights, uh, freedoms on the other. Of course, uh, these two may come together, but at least in Hong Kong, you can see that now we are facing a very, very difficult moment because if we want to safeguard our true, our core values, uh, it seems that we need to pay a very uh, a very high price, and uh, and at the same time, it's getting more and more difficult for us to safeguard all these values and very important uh, system uh, that that is uh, one country, two system, or even our uh, independence, judicial independence. So I think the same questions should be asked by each and everyone in the world because. Um, you know, this is globalization. People are uh, very uh, uh, closely connected. So I think um, it's important to do uh, to do well, at least to let uh, the uh, international community to understand Hong Kong and and to make them pay attention to uh, the development or at least the changes in Hong Kong uh, in the long run. So going forward with this, Tanya, um, from your perspective, um, how will you work together with the government moving forward? Um, at this moment, of course, of course, we don't have a very close working relationship because we try to invite uh, the chief executive, Mrs. Carrie Lam, to, to come to LegCo to have a special meeting and to explain to the public about this new national security law. Um, however, she uh, refused to do so. Uh, the, uh, only the uh, Secretary for Justice and the Secretary for Bureau, uh, Secretary for Security, uh, Secretary for Security, came here and explained uh, the uh, kind of details or implementation rules uh, uh, to us. But still, um, um, it's. Um, I don't think it's possible to change or to um, uh, to to change the situation in a very short while. But at the same time, I, I do believe that this new law uh, would affect a uh, lot of policies of various departments as well as uh, bureaus. So I urge the government to give us full details of how this uh, national security law uh, would affect um, people's life uh, from various uh, perspectives. And are you concerned at all that the law could lead to pro-democracy lawmakers being disqualified from the LegCo elections coming up this fall? Has that been a concern? Uh, uh, yes, of course, this is one of our concerns because, uh, as uh, we have uh, discussed, uh, the terms are vague, uh, but it's very, very powerful. So uh, the application of this law, the implementation of this law is really up to uh, the government so and up to the target uh, well, who are they targeting to so um, uh, those who are going to run uh, the uh, electrical election in September may probably face a, uh, a disqualification uh, during um, July or early August but I don't think that will scare people away uh, as long as we can cast vote uh, we will definitely cast our vote and uh, of course the uh, with this law, it would make um, the civil society even stronger because um, uh, not 
well, simply based、uh, rely on legislature is not sufficient because you can see that this piece of law, such an important piece of law, the government just bypass legislature. So、uh, I guess、um, uh, the civil society will become more and more powerful, and uh, and uh, I think this is the the the, cohe- the coherent one of the coherent fronts that、uh, Hong Kong people、uh, can.、Uh, Work together and fight for more. Yeah, Nathan, I, I want to go to you now.、Um, sounds like there's a lot of uncertainty. There are critics、um, who can't believe you left Hong Kong. How do you respond to them? Well,、uh, I think、uh, well, in the future, I will continue to commit myself into the international advocacy work. And、uh, well, in these、uh, past few days, I've been doing a lot of、uh, relevant stuff. So for me,、um, is A commitment actually towards the movement, and、um, we all know that the national security law really limited the room of doing so in Hong Kong. And uh, so, uh, yeah, in the future, I-, I will continue to fight for Hong Kong democracy. And I think people understand that we need to have a different position on different fronts,、uh, so that we could better utilize our own ab-、uh, ability. And so, what is your goal? And are you worried you won't be able to come back to Hong Kong anytime soon? Well,、um, a lot of people, especially those frontline protesters, we all sacrifice a part of our lives in the movement. And for me, leaving Hong Kong is tough. And、uh, knowing that I might ha- be unable to go back to Hong Kong for a long while is also a, a tough choice. Especially if you take reference from the implementation of national security law in China, which it is. Actually, not only targeting yourself, but a collateral damage.、Uh, well, if you are a persecuted person in mainland China, your families, your kids, your 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 parents may be affected. So this is also、uh, a tough choice for me.、Um, a really a a choice that I have to ponder and contemplate for a long while before making it. But for me, I think、um, all our part to play. And、uh, having a perfect on the international level, doing international advocacy work, is crucial for Hong Kong's movement. And I think、um, for me, it's natural for me to take that position,、uh, especially、uh, well for what I've been doing for the past year for the movement. Um, so um, yes, indeed,、uh, I hope that I could one day go back to Hong Kong to be united with my friends and families, and that they could. Possibly be the day when Hong Kong is free and democratized, and I hope that it will come soon. What do you miss the most about Hong Kong so far? Well,、um, especially all my relatives,、uh, like Tanya, I miss you so much, and、um, and the others who have been trying their best to really、um, conquer that kind of fear and the pressure from Beijing. I admire them very much. And also my families, and of course、uh, my two cats,、um, uh, two little cats that、um, that, I, that I rescued them from the streets. So、um, yeah, these are all、um, great things. But I know that、um, on the road towards democracy, there have to be sacrifices.、Uh, mine is minor compared to a lot of street、um, frontline protesters who they face much more difficulties leaving Hong Kong and facing all the trials and. All sorts of things. So I'm just playing my part, and I hope that、uh, we can,、um, yeah, work together and、uh, well liberate Hong Kong very soon. Tony, I see you're you're getting very emotional listening to Nathan、uh, talk now.、Um, you know, how are you going to support the pro democracy movement going forward? Can you talk a little bit about any strategy you may have to keep this momentum going in Hong Kong for you? Um, for me,、uh, I'm going to kind of leave the arena very soon because、uh, I'm going to because I can't run any elect election in five years、uh, because of my conviction、uh, last year. So,、uh, but but then as a as a Hong Kong citizen, I may explore. Um, different position as、uh, as Nathan because、uh, he now got a very good position to do something for, for Hong Kong, and for me, I do believe that、uh, with my experience and with my、um, with my legal background, I will I will find a、uh, position that I can、um, I can、uh, help 
uh, various people, certain people, and uh, to make Hong Kong a better place, a better home place for all of us, and and stay here and wait for Nathan to come back. Thank you. And Nathan, last question for you. How will you work with the Hong Kong government going forward? Well, I, I think they're hunting for me, so um, it's difficult for me to work with them. Um, but uh, for me, I think uh, what's important is uh, I need to really deliver the message of Hong Kong people and their demands uh, to the international community when, uh, well, on the current situation, when they try to say so and we will put them in danger. Uh, so that is my responsibility. And I hope that uh, the international community to really recognize the crisis happening in Hong Kong and adopted measures um, targeting the authoritarian expansion to China, not only in Hong Kong, but in Xinjiang, we've seen concentration camp, uh, the military intimidation to Taiwan, and also all, all the behaviors in the um, South China Sea. And these are grave concerns towards the international community. And uh, so, yeah, that, that is uh, the role that I will play, and I will continue to stick with my Hong Kong fellows and hope that I could contribute to Hong, the Hong Kong movement with my position. Yeah, it sounds like uh, the security law creating uh, a lot of uncertainty, um, but uh, the pro-democracy movement uh, still going forward. Uh, that wraps things up for us here. Thanks so much to our special guest, Nathan Law, a pro-democracy activist, and Tanya Chen, founding member of the Hong Kong Civic Party. And thank you all for watching. Make sure to follow us at Quick Take and at Business for all the latest updates and more. Bye for now.